Let me just do a sound check for the folks online. Can you hear me okay? Thumbs up? Great, thanks. We'll get started in probably just a minute or two. Really big welcome to everyone. Thanks for coming. We have about 20 people in the room and 20 people online. So it's nice that we can gather in this new world of hybrid programs. And uh, it's just nice, even though, you know, everyone has to do what they have to do. We, it is nice to have a sense of we're creating community for these six weeks. Because I know, and I'm sure you know, it's easy to get pushed and pulled by your other responsibilities. Maybe you have kids at home or whatever, but that's okay if you have to miss a week. I am recording. That's why I've spotlighted myself. Those of you online, you can always choose the gallery view if you want to see the other people that are online with you. But what I'll do is I'll send out an email, you know, a few days later, like on Thursday, and it will have the recording from that previous Tuesday. And that way, if you got work you have to do or family stuff you have to do, you can still be part. Don't feel like, oh, I'm going to give up and do it next time. There may not be a next time. So just stick with it as best you can. And what I often say, too, to the intro class especially is come next Tuesday night, even if you're finding the work we're doing here really valuable, it's just easy, as you know, for the mind to create reasons. It was a hard day or whatever. I'm just going to stay home or I'm just not going to go online. I've been on the computer all day long. That's the last thing I should do. But it's a rare thing that humans have. It's really a, a privilege, you know, that we have the interest and enough space in our lives to get interested in the mind. And it's Truly, I think it's got to be right up there as one or two most amazing things about our human existence is we have a mind, or you in Buddhism, mind, heart, same word, chitta is the Pali. We have this heart, we have this sensitive mind, and we've been so caught up in the details and busyness and hopes and fears, we've spent very little time 
turning the attention to the mind itself, which is truly extraordinary because it's relevant, <laughs> you know, that there's a mind. We should be interested. And we actually, I know it sounds a little weird to say this, we have the capacity to be aware of what the mind is doing, to be aware of what the mind is knowing. So let's just try that before I say anything more. Let's just do a little practice, this awareness, Buddhist awareness practice, mindful awareness practice, sitting comfortably. Don't feel like you have to find any particular posture for yourself. Eyes can be open or lightly closed. And simply notice, be aware of what the mind is noticing what the mind is doing. So for example, you might be feeling self-conscious. So then just be aware that self-consciousness is like this, is being known or being felt. What else is being known? Maybe the experience of the body sitting, the sensations of sitting being known. Maybe you're hearing the blower. Hearing is being known. What else is the mind knowing? And notice this particular kind of interest in the present moment. It's a subtle quality, this ability we have to be interested in something ordinary and very easy to get distracted, to think about things in the way we habitually think about things, but just to stay interested. Sitting is like this. You could even be interested in something very simple and ordinary, like feeling the air touching the skin of the face. It's probably a neutral experience that we tend to ignore, but that subtle touching, that subtle experience of temperature as you tune into the face and the sensations of the air, maybe you even feel a little breeze Noticing any tension in the face, like around the eyes. It's not about changing the tension. It's just noticing how it is. Noticing the jaw, the mouth, or the lips touching or apart. Notice the scalp. Maybe you can feel the weight of the hair. Are the ears warm or cool? And taking some time and simply receiving the sensations in the neck and throat. No expectations. We're not trying to fix anything. We're just opening, receiving, allowing the sensations in the throat and neck to be the way they are. Is it okay just to tune in, to receive? And to keep in mind the sensations in the neck. And then receiving, opening to the tops of the shoulders. Even if <clears throat> you're feeling some tension here. Is it okay? Is it safe to feel tension and just letting it be? And it might unwind, but it might not, but we're just gonna receive it nonetheless. Even willing to be intimate with the tops of the shoulders and also including the shoulder joints, feeling them just as they are. Including the more subtle sensation of feeling your clothes against the skin here. Down both arms. Feel the skin, feel any tension. 
feeling that bend of the elbows if there is a bend. Feel the air against the back of the palms, back of the hands. And any places of contact where the hands are resting, maybe on your thighs or maybe in your lap. Just feeling those simple touch sensations of the hands, however they're touching. Feel that experience of pressure or, or whatever it is. And then learning to be receptive now to the upper chest and upper back. And we're gonna slowly open to the torso. And again, remember, we're not looking for any particular experience here. We're just receiving the way it is in the upper chest, collarbones, breastbone, the rib cage, the breasts, and the space between the shoulder blades, the back, upper back. Mid chest, solar plexus, middle of the back. You might feel that ordinary expansion and contraction with the regular breathing. You might even feel subtle movement, beating of the heart. And of course, all the ordinary tensions that you might feel in the upper back or middle of the back and in the chest and the solar plexus. And being interested and receptive now to the belly, the entire abdomen and lower back, lower spine. and including the pelvis as well, right down to the floor of the pelvis, feel that contact, whether you're on a cushion or sitting on a chair, feeling the groin, and taking some time, let's feel the whole torso, pelvis together including the arms and shoulders and neck and head, even the top of the head. Just an unconditional acceptance. Just a willingness, it's an act of kindness actually, a willingness to be awake a willingness to simply feel what we're feeling before we continue down. So from the hip sockets, we're gonna feel what's moving in the thighs, pleasant, unpleasant sensations, feel the sensations moving in the knees and in the calves and shins. Present with the ankles, just receiving tops of the feet, sides of the feet, tuning into the heels and the Achilles, and the toes and bottoms of the feet, and both legs, both feet together. whole body together. And just an open question, keep it an open question. Is it safe to simply feel this totality of the body sitting? Just to allow the sensations to be received, to be felt, and to be both relaxed and alert as we 
allow the sensations of the body to be, not needing to judge, as if we're gonna be present right in the middle of the experience of the body, bodily sensation. Undefended. Just recognize, and you can even repeat this phrase, sensations are being known here and now. Sensations are being felt here and now. Can this be okay? In a sense, can I allow these sensations to come and go, to be felt? Not in conflict, not needing to judge them, even if they're unpleasant. Because as we all know, sometimes the bodily sensations are unpleasant and it feels like this. Can this be okay? Okay enough to relax and allow. Okay enough to be kind or to be relating in a kind way to the body, just as it is. And the last thing, just to check, as you notice this capacity to be aware, aware of the present moment, because of course the sensations that we're feeling are being known here and now in the present moment. Is there a way to stop being aware? Like an off button. So this is important. Awareness isn't something we do and it isn't something we stop doing. A more accurate way of understanding it, it's something we recognize. There is awareness. So when you're ready, just allow the eyes to open. Adjust your body. If you have some stiffness, you can stretch a little, whatever you need to do. And again, welcome everyone. So my name is Mark Nunberg. I know some of you and some of you maybe are new to the center. So a very big welcome to anybody who showed up for the first time. Common Ground Meditation Center has been here for, this is our 30th year. My spouse and I, Wynn Fricke, who's also one of the teachers here, started it back in 1993. And we're in the early Buddhist tradition or Theravada Buddhism, but here in the West, These kind of meditation centers are often referred to as insight meditation or vipassana meditation. So you might've heard those words, some of you. And there are different practices, but the main practice is what we might call awareness practice or mindful awareness practice. Cultivating this capacity to be present with things just as they are. And a lot of people, you know, they associate Buddhism with sitting still, like getting up early and sitting for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. But it's important right from the start, even though this is a introduction to meditation practice, that the formal time that hopefully you'll have at least 10 minutes a day, if not longer, maybe even twice a day to put in some practice, formal practice. But Formal practice is a little bit like kindergarten, right? It's like finding that time in your life, in your home schedule, where conditions are relatively settled. (laughs) Kids aren't screaming. Dog is in the other room or cat's in the other room. TV's off, cell phone's off. Where you can simplify your conditions. That's why it's like kindergarten, right? Because we're learning to recognize awareness 
present moment awareness. And we're learning to value that recognition of present moment awareness, making it in a sense our best friend. There is really, and you'll you know, have to check this out for yourselves, but there really isn't any place where awareness wouldn't be helpful. You know, some people might think, well, you know, when I'm hanging out with my lover, I don't want to be present. It would be weird or, you know, whatever. No. I mean, even if we're doing something wrong, like stealing something, so I don't really want to be awake then because I won't do it. <laughs> well, see, that's the point. Because <laughs> awareness is like a, a beautiful, simple mirror. I mean, this is just one simile. It's not a perfect simile. But it's a useful simile, this big, beautiful, perfect mirror doesn't judge. A mirror doesn't judge you. You stand in front of your mirror at home. It's not wagging your finger, its finger at you like, I can't believe you ate those cookies or, you know, you haven't taken a bath in three days. The mirror just reflects back the way it is. And <clears throat> If the mirror is reflecting back something that's really despicable or messy, that isn't a burden on the mirror. Or if the mirror is reflecting back something really sublime and beautiful, that's not a burden on the mirror. So it's really important because a lot of, it's just our habit, like when you take a class on mindful awareness, mindful me mindfulness meditation, the habit will be this is another thing I have to do. And so what we end up doing is we equate mindfulness or mindful awareness with focusing my attention. But they're different mental operations, somewhat related, but not as related as, as you might think. This isn't about focusing your attention on some experience, although some of that paying attention, like to the breath or even the body scan we just did, we were bringing our attention to different places in the body. So it can be um, a training or, or a technique that can help us recognize present moment awareness, but it isn't the present moment awareness itself that focusing your attention on some experience. Awareness isn't something we do as much as it is something we're learning to appreciate and recognize. Like, is the mind aware? How do you know the mind's aware right now? Assuming your answer to my earlier question was yes, the mind's aware. How do you know? How do we know the mind's aware right now? Well, I could answer that by saying, well, seeing's being known. Right now I'm seeing. I'm hearing, hearing's being known. I'm noticing my mind is peaceful. Peacefulness is being known. So in a way, we're knowing what the mind is knowing. That's what the mirror does. It's a reflective knowing what the mind is doing, what the mind is knowing, what the mind is feeling. And in this business, which is this business here at Common Ground is people who are interested, you know, we, you might've heard the word Dharma or Dhamma, one's Sanskrit, one's Pali language, both are ancient Indian languages. Um, early Buddhism is most of the teachings are recorded in Pali. So we say Dhamma and it's kind of become an English word, although mostly misused, but one simple, definition of the word dhamma or dharma is the way it is the way it is not our mental or cognitive interpretation i'm at common ground it's tuesday night i've got stress in my life so i'm going to learn mindfulness meditation so i feel better right that's thought being known that's a thought being known and where is every experience whether we're aware of sittings like this or thinkings like this, or we hear something and we look outside, you know, car, that's a car. All experience, past, present, future, all experience is being known here and now, right? 
And what is this here and now? Well, in Buddhism, we call it mind. Isn't that where you know? <laughs> Isn't that where knowing happens? I mean, that's the word. And we don't mean the brain, although clearly, you know, we're talking really from the subjective experience. So when you're sad, where is that being known? Or when you're happy, where's that being known? Or you're having an ordinary experience and you're touching wood, where's that being known? It's being known here and now in the mind and the heart. Mind, heart, same word. So we're going to train the mind to remember that the mind has the capacity to know what it's knowing, to know what it's sensitive to. And it doesn't keep us from being a good mom or a good lover or a good friend, a good citizen, a good activist or whatever we do with our life. It's really at the root of all competence. Like if you want to be competent at anything, even bad stuff, like you know, being a thief or something like that, it really helps to sustain present moment awareness. It's not easy being doing bad stuff when you sustain present moment awareness. Because one of the things about cultivating present moment awareness is it has this real breath. As opposed to like when we're just focusing on one thing, like getting even with somebody who hurt our feelings, we can block out a lot. But when you'll see in our training that we'll be doing these six weeks, it's not just like something we say because people have a lot of bodily tension. Oh, you should relax. Relaxation, softening, letting go of the chronic armor and defensiveness we drag, drag around with us, it's essential. It's not really, we're not really able to be open when we're tight. I mean, we can be open that there is tightness, but when the tightness is being, um, that when we somehow associate being present as a tight thing, we're going in the wrong direction. We're in that direction of trying to make something happen, trying to fix something, trying to control something, you know, trying to get somewhere. But that's not remembering to recognize the present moment. That's our normal egoic activity, you know, trying to control things, trying to fix things. It's as if we live our life in conflict with reality. You know, life's a slog. It's like we're going through life with our machete, struggling, constantly patching things up, trying to, I mean, isn't that sort of fitting for how it feels for us a lot of the time? Now, life isn't going to change, you know, meaning the difficult circumstances aren't going to evaporate because we're cultivating this remembering, this recognition of awareness. But what's going to happen is that slog of being a human being, trying to be in a relationship with another human being or being a human being who's trying to earn a living or make society a better place, a more fair and just place, right? Those activities are still going to be, you know, in an objective sense, difficult. But what begins to happen when we cultivate this practice is, a, and it's hard to put into words, but it's like a sense of space, right? I'm talking about our subjective experience. So there I am in a sticky interaction with my partner or sticky interaction at, at work or with my parents or, you know, whatever it might be. But right there in the push and pull, twist and turn, turns of our life, there's that sense of open space. And it has both a kind of clarity, but also a real breadth, wide, soft. Soft in the sense of, um, it's almost like the heart is learning to grow roots into each moment. Now, we don't, 
we don't necessarily want to become more sensitive, but it's too late. You're already here. <laughs> I always joke. We should have a sign, big sign at the beginning. Are you sure you want to enter? Because if you start cultivating mindful awareness, you're going to become a more sensitive person. But that sensitivity, as hard as it is in this world, with this mind and body and all the other minds and bodies around us, it's difficult to be sensitive because it's, it's a wild place. And there's a lot of horror, actually, and a lot of good, a lot of beauty, right? But it's the whole, one teacher calls it the whole catastrophe. That's what life is at this time on this planet in this way. But that sensitivity, it creates, it's like a, a creates a creative tension that supports the, the deepening of wisdom and understanding that space of wisdom, that space of equanimity, that space of balance. You could even say that space of love, right? Because it's not, it's to be experienced. Don't worry about the words so much. And it's not like you're not going to be able to sense that until you've been practicing, like I've been practicing now pretty sincerely for 40 years. When you get to be 40, then only then, well, no one's going to put in 40 years on some promise. And the Buddha was very clear. We start to get a sense, that taste of freedom, that sense of loving, clear, broad space in the beginning and in the middle and in the end. But we have to sense it, like how we're being changed. And it isn't even so much that you had a good sit. Oh, yeah, that sit was good. Okay, I'm all for this practice. Actually, more compelling evidence that your formal sitting practice is a benefit is how you're changed as you move through your day. A little less reactivity, a little bit more creative space when you're in a pickle with another person or having to figure something out or stuff in tra stuck in traffic. And it's almost like you see, oh, I could get angry. I could get tight. Or I could have this serene sense of humor. Oh yeah, sometimes it's like this. And how wonderful it is to see that off-ramp to get tight and angry and to want to blame somebody and not take it. Like I, I could go down that road. But why? I could just realize it feels like this now. Oh, yeah. And I, I feel this tension because I need to get somewhere. And I'm not sure I'm going to be on time. And that feels like this. But I know how to be with that worry and the tension that goes with that worry. Right? It's like in that space of the present moment includes the bodily sensations. It includes the emotions and the activity of the mind. And what we're learning is like, I know how to be intimate, even when it's messy, even when it's stormy, even when it's unpleasant, even when it's calm and peaceful, even when it's joyful. We're learning how to meet life experience as it is. And it's not about being passive. This is the other thing I like to mention at the beginning of this uh, six week class, because a lot of people just, you know, superficially hearing about Buddhism and mindfulness practice, people create a, a stereotypic idea. Oh, it's the person who's completely passive and disassociating and disconnected. And, you know, the world's messy. So I'm just going to go into my little sweet spot. La, 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 la. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to hear it. That's not wisdom, you know. And it's stressful to have a life where we're sensitive and to be dependent on being disconnected. Try it. It doesn't work. It's stressful. And even people who have a lot of resources, you know, and have the gated communities or whatever, you know, even the, the billionaires have their own islands and their own yachts that are like islands, <laughs> except they move around. You know, are they happy? No. They're, they're no happier than anybody else. I mean, I'm not saying that I, it's nice that I have a place to go home, a safe home. I like that. I have good food I can eat. I live in a relatively orderly town. 
you know, I appreciate all that. And I wouldn't choose chaos, but when chaos comes my way, I want to be ready to work with it. So it's not that we go looking for negative or difficult circumstances in our life, but we want, we know that as a human being, we're vulnerable to difficult stuff happening. I mean, old age, sickness, and death is kind of part of the scene here <laughs> as human beings and loss, gain and loss, right? So what is it that gives us immunity? So mindfulness, uh, mindfulness practice, mindful awareness practice, it isn't just to reduce stress. It's really about retraining our heart to be human when there is uncertainty and vulnerability and old, old age, sickness and death. Like how can we be right in the middle, engaged, sensitive, empathetic, and you know, this, is, this should be really provocative what I'm about to say. So here we are, fully alive, fully engaged, human being in relationship and somehow free with all that's moving, including what's moving in my own heart. Like when you trigger me, it's not like I can't be triggered, but there's something that gives the heart immunity. Like, because there's awareness, there's an awareness that I've been triggered. And there's an awareness that being triggered, like maybe you made me mad. Oh, being mad feels like this. And because we've been training with awareness, we've learned slowly, gradually, how to feel the anger. And so the, the ordinary situation as a human being who's been triggered and there's a lot of anger, I still have to decide like, what do I say to that person? Or do I walk out of the room? Or do I tell them what needs to be said, speak truth to power? I mean, the appropriate response is going to only be understood in that moment, right? Because it's complex. You can't like have a plan. You have to, but what allows for the appropriate response is learning to be able to feel everything that's moving, to be present. Because when we're present and intimate, then we can see, oh yeah, I just want to hurt them. It's not about taking care of the situation. It's like, you hurt me, now I want to hurt you. Well, where, where does, that doesn't work, right? But wisdom knows that because it's there. It's, it's sensing it all. So if there's something that needs to be done or something that needs to be said that's helpful all around, then we're not afraid to do that. But if there's nothing right now that needs to be said or done, then there's nothing that needs to be said or done right now. And the heart's, wisdom's okay with that too. Right, because I can just be with the anger that's been triggered, and I know, oh yeah, sometimes it's like that situation arises, that um, that very strong emotion, and it feels like this. It moves, so it's not a repress a repression of the anger. We're totally letting it express itself. We're just not acting it out with words or actions. Same with lust or any strong emotion that humans just have. So it isn't about, the practice isn't about being unhuman or inhuman. It's about being more fully human because we have this wise and loving space of wisdom and awareness that isn't confused by what moves when you're human. Oh yeah, it's like this. You know, there's that, um, I forget who said it, some American author about 100 years ago, I think, uh, and you might have heard it, it's quoted a lot, and it goes something like this, this is a rough paraphrase, if we knew the secret histories of our enemies, you know, they wouldn't be enemies. I mean, we still might need to oppose their actions, but we would understand that their despicable behavior because some behavior really is terrible and harmful and should be stopped, but we would see the roots of it. And we would understand that although I have to 
<clears throat> stop them if I can, if it's my responsibility from causing harm. I don't need to throw them out of my heart. I was uh, an elementary school teacher in the 80s. And, uh, you know, it's one of the first things you learn as a teacher, so like, because <laughs> children have a way, you know, to push adults' buttons. And uh, it's like, you don't hate the kid, you know, but that doesn't mean the behavior is okay. And you, you can even say that to a kid, you know, this behavior can't happen here. And you might even explain why it can't happen here. So we're going to do some things so that behavior doesn't happen. But I'm not throwing you out of my heart. You still belong, but that behavior doesn't belong. You know, so when the teacher hasn't lost it, they can convey that and, you know, in their own particular way to the kid. And it's really the same with their own what's arising in our own mind and body and heart. It's like you belong, right? Because whatever emotion gets triggered, there's some lawfulness to it. It just didn't come from outer space. There's some causes and conditions that have led me to be experiencing this right now. So when it's already here, the only thing for wisdom to do is say, you're already here. So yes, I'm saying yes to you. Not because I want to be feeling this or want to be having this experience, but because it's like this now. So we say, yes, it's like this now. And there are reasons, causes and conditions. So what's showing up for us as individuals, what's showing up for us as groups, communities, it's lawful. That doesn't mean it's fair. People misunderstand karma. Like, oh, you deserve this. That's not the, what the Buddha taught. He just says things are lawful, conditional. So when the tsunami comes, oh, you must have, you know, drunk too much water when you were a kid, or, I mean, in a previous life. And so now you're experiencing a tsunami or something like that. I mean, it's just kind of crazy stuff people start to think. It just means that everything in this interconnected way, all these different forces internally, externally, they're just expressing themselves, just like weather. You know, weather, what is it? It isn't like one thing that makes today, the weather today, the way it is. It's a very complex, interdependent web. So when we're having a particular experience, that's, that's what wisdom understands. Oh, of course, given everything that's in motion, it can't be different. I could wish that my body were different or my life situation were different or my financial situation were different or the world situation were different. But wishing things to be different than they are is stressful. And wanting things to be different than they are, the wanting itself doesn't change things. What changes things? Understanding the conditional, the lawful nature. Right? So if we want to change our conditions, external or internal, we need that stable present moment awareness that is just calmly observing how things come to be. So your relationship with your spouse is going to hell, but you've been cultivating the stable present moment awareness and you, you can't not see how you're participating in your relationship going down the drain. You'll know something about what needs to be cultivated and what needs to be abandoned. Because you've been paying attention in this non-judging, relaxed, and somewhat continuous way. But that's a muscle we haven't developed yet, most of us. So that's why we take a class like this to develop that mental muscle for continuity of present moment awareness. So that's what we'll be doing these weeks. We're gonna stretch now, uh, but maybe I'll just see if there's any questions about what I've said thus far. First, let me just check with people in the room. Any questions, confusing things about what I said that come to mind? And how about the people online? You can just unmute yourself or raise your digital hand. Any questions yet? 
And I'll just remind folks that uh, it's really good actually to um, send via email any questions or even reflections about what you're learning in your practice to me. And I'll weave them into the classes as we go forward. Good, so why don't we stand up, stretch the legs, and we'll just do a little standing meditation because the Buddha taught, as you might expect, to be mindful in all postures. Switch the camera a little bit so you can see me. Good. So obviously, there's no right or wrong way to stand, but it's nice to have the knees a little bent. Otherwise, we tend to stand like a statue, which is sort of, yeah, it takes a lot of tension to maintain that. But if we're more fluid when we're standing, that's a nice way to do standing meditation. Now, you can imagine, where would this be good? Waiting in line at the checkout counter, right? Because it's like, otherwise our option is to be stressed because we're waiting for our turn. But then we could just practice being present. And even though focusing on bodily sensations, like the sensations of standing, isn't the awareness, it can be a useful training. So just be aware of the physicality and what we're aware of actually is that the sensations of standing are being known. So it's not about doing it right. It's about being intimate. This is being known. And not only are we going to feel the sensations of standing, but we're going to notice different reactions like the mind, the thinking mind has opinions about what we're feeling in the body. So just notice in the background that mental activity without trying to stop it. And even though the physicality of standing will be in the forefront of our attention, there's hearing in the background, mental activity, the thoughts in the background, seeing is happening there. And it's kind of nice for those of you who are learning mindful awareness for the first time, it's kind of like zooming in and zooming out. So sometimes to kind of get, let the attention go to something very specific, like actually feeling that touching of the foot, one of the feet, and maybe even one particular part of the foot, like the heel or the ball of the toe, the big toe, but just tuning into something very specific in that relaxed and clear way. So just choose something specific to tune into, to keep right in the forefront. And then in a relaxed way, just widen out. So all of the senses are there, the seeing, the hearing, Maybe not so much smelling and tasting, but sensing sensations and even mental activity. All here and now and the totality of our experience. And just letting everything be. Not in conflict. And we're going to sit down in a minute or so, but I'll say one more thing in the email that hopefully all of you got. And if you didn't get it, maybe it's because you didn't register and you can still register and I'll get your email that way. And you'll get an email from each week. And, um, but in the email that I sent out, there was a link for the handouts. One of the handouts is for walking meditation. And for some of you, walking meditation will be more useful than sitting meditation, you know, especially if, there's a lot of chronic pain when you sit. 
And walking isn't just like strolling around and checking people out. You want to choose a place to walk. I mean, it could even be a hallway, especially this time of year in Minnesota, in your place you live, that's not too cluttered, meaning there's not too many things that are going to trigger a lot of thought. So maybe not a hallway where you got it covered with family photos. And there's that brother who never calls or something, you know, because every time you pass it, you're going to want to think about that person. So something simple that's not too um, triggering of thought, where you just walk back and forth. And the physicality of walking back and forth could be a bit of a supportive training ground to help you recognize present moment awareness because you recognize the lifting and the placing, lifting, placing. You notice the stopping. You notice the turning, the lifting, placing, lifting, place. Stopping, turning, lifting, play, right? So that physicality of just walking back and forth, 15 feet at least, you know, it's nice. Otherwise it gets a little uh, too tight if you don't have, you know, at least 15 feet. So see where you can find that or do it outside or just walk around the block three times for your meditation. And still pretty much doing the same thing, cultivating the continuity of present moment awareness, noticing when the mind gets lost in thought, coming back, recognizing, oh yeah, awareness is still here. I didn't break it. (laughs) We can't break it. You can't start it and you can't stop it. All you can do is forget it, right? So in this practice we're doing, there's only one enemy, distraction or forgetfulness. We forget that the mind is capable of being present even while we do everything we do in life. We tend to get absorbed. And the Buddha says it's as if you're already dead, right? In English, we would say you're on autopilot. You sort of, you can do really sophisticated stuff like fall in love, but you can do it on autopilot. You're not, there isn't that space that understands, oh, this is happening. It feels like this. And it's only in that space of awareness where we have some semblance of what might be skillful and unskillful. It's really the birthplace of morality in a Buddhist sense, which is internal. Morality, like what's right and wrong, we feel directly when we're present. But we have to be present because then we have a sense of the quality of our motivation and intention. Is it wholesome or not? So let's sit down. Oh, so I was just going to say, so there is a handout on on walking meditation. I think it might be listed under week three, but you can just look through the handouts and print that out if you want, or just read the digital copy. So we're going to do some sitting practice, and I'm going to teach the mindfulness of breathing practice. So take your time. Make sure you're sitting in a way that's relatively comfortable. And we'll do about a 20 minute, maybe a slightly longer practice. Next week, I'll talk a little bit more about your posture, but tonight, tonight, just whatever posture allows you to be both Relax to some degree at least and alert. <clears throat> One simple ritual that can be nice at the beginning of a sitting time just takes a minute or so. It's just to take a couple of longer, deeper, full breaths and really slow it down in a way where you're not straining. You just simply fill your lungs slowly, relaxed, and then empty the lungs. And you do that a couple times. And at the same time, you're just feeling what that feels like to be breathing in deeply, slowly. It's really just a simple gift to the body and the mind. And eventually, 
Allow the breathing to continue on its own. We don't have to make it any particular way. We just trust the body to do the breathing. Even if it feels erratic. And simply cultivate an interest in the sensations of breathing in and breathing out, wherever, however you feel that in your body. You might feel it as a touching at the nostrils, or you might feel it better as a movement in your abdomen and rib cage, or some combination. But we're simply learning to track that ordinary phenomena of breathing in and breathing out. And it's all a matter of choosing to be interested in something ordinary. It doesn't require tension. And it doesn't require the breath to be any particular way. Let the body breathe even if it's not the way you like. <coughs> so from the very beginning of the inhalation, just sustaining that relaxed interest until the last moments of breathing in. And then from the beginning of the out breath, sustaining awareness to the very end of the out breath. And just try to do this one half breath at a time because you can be successful with that. And reminding ourselves to relax as often as you need to. And just begin again and again when you notice that the attention has drifted off or gotten entangled in some little drama. And again, the effort is the effort to be interested in the meditation object, which is that simple physical experience of breathing in and breathing out, however you're feeling it. And when you get a little continuity, you'll notice there's a subtle pleasure in the secludedness of the mind, the non-distraction is pleasant, but in a subtle way. So see if you can notice that.
And then one last instruction. At times, of course, the mind will get caught up in some distraction for a while. And then you'll notice that the mind's been lost in thought. And in that moment, take some time and just acknowledge having been distracted is like this. And in that sense, you want to feel what's reverberating because the mind had been distracted, caught in thought. What's the feeling here? So don't feel like you have to rush back to the breath. Take a moment, a couple moments, and just feel what it feels like to have been distracted. Even if it's really unpleasant, it's really good to acknowledge, oh yeah, feels like this now. In a way, we're making peace with whatever got stirred up with the distraction. And then come back, feel the breath moving there in the body. Connect with the next in-breath or out-breath. And then cultivate that relaxed interest in this ordinary phenomena of breathing in and breathing out. So let's continue maybe for about 10 minutes or so in silence. Just do the best you can. Keep starting over. Don't give up. See if you can feel some happiness in doing this work, connecting, sustaining.
willing to begin again and again, no judgment. And even being curious about distraction, like how that happens, how that arises. And learning to more quickly just acknowledge, oh, this is being known. This is what's happening. Feels like this. And then feel the body sitting, feel the breath moving in the body. Just use that interest to reconnect and then sustain awareness with the breathing process just as best you can. Got another five minutes, just do the best you can. And now we're gonna allow the eyes to open, but we're not looking around, we're just sitting in a relaxed way, eyes open. We're not bringing the attention back to the breath, but you might still notice the breath coming in and going out. But we're gonna take these last minute, maybe two minutes, and cultivate this breath of awareness. So instead of focusing on anything in particular, just the sense of this moment being known, whatever the particular experience that's in the forefront of attention, doesn't really matter. 
We're just recognizing that this is being known. It's like this now. So you could say we're sustaining present moment awareness, but without focusing on anything in particular. So just see what you can do with this. Sustaining present moment awareness. And notice that this presence has a trustworthy quality of love. Acceptance. Patience. even fearlessness. And again, stretch out as you need to. Make sure your body's comfortable. It's really been helpful over the years of teaching this class, people sharing their questions and what they learned. And so we're gonna do that now. We have about a little bit more than 10 minutes left It'd be really nice to hear from a couple folks, either online or here in the room. What was that like? Did you learn anything about your mind or about the practice questions? Anything about the instructions that was uh, confusing? Yeah, people online, you could just unmute yourselves. Um, People here, just raise your hand so I know you wanna talk. Yeah, please. Yeah. Alistair, could you, would you mind just coming up here and so that people can hear you? You can sit right here on this bench. Sorry. Put you on the spot. That's okay. I took a public speaking class. Hey, there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Alistair and I, yeah, I took a class last year with a really great meditation teacher, but it was only 25 minutes long. So <laughs> I think I, yeah, I really would like to kind of develop my practice more. I've learned about, I've known about meditation for a long, long time, but never really was intentional with coming to a class. So <coughs> this is uh, the first day. Super excited. Nice to meet you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, and there are a lot of, I'm sure people realize that there are a lot of different types of meditation out there, and uh, we're not, you know, judging the other forms. But it's nice when you're taking this class to give the awareness, mindful awareness practice, your attention. And if you've learned other things that have been helpful, just let this set them aside for the six weeks so you can get a sense of what this style of practice is. Yeah, thanks for getting us started. Who else would like to share learnings, questions that have come up? Yeah, please, John, you wanna come up? Zoom community, remember you're not anonymous. <laughs> you want to hear from you? So I found it really helpful uh, when you mentioned about, you know, when you get distracted, not to come right back, but to kind of feel what it was like to be distracted. Uh, I've never done that before. And what I found was that, um, it's hard to describe, 
it was kind of like when I was thinking about whatever happened, uh, that I was in this very gentle but whirlwind that kind of captured me. And, and I wasn't sure if it was um, stressful, but it wasn't calm either. And it was just really useful to pay attention to that moment. And I, I'm going to use that. And isn't it interesting the way that John described that? We know there was awareness. How do we know there was awareness? Because John, when he was sharing with us a moment ago, he, the mind recalled a lot of the details. It could only recall details if there is a presence. So that's what you described so well, John, is what I was saying earlier in the evening, that space that starts to come in. And by the way, John's been practicing for a while and has done some longer retreats. So this is the, what develops is that capacity that like when we're willing to acknowledge that the mind is distracted, the attention might get caught back in the vortex of whatever that distraction is. But there remains some awareness that the mind is caught, that this is happening, that the body's like this. Right, And we want to learn not to be afraid of the wildness of our body and mind and the world, by the way. Right? But for sure, with this training, the body and the mind. Because a lot of times in practice, we want to be this dominant, we want the meditator to be this dominant force. And so when the mind is misbeha misbehaving, we want to shut it down. But that's not meditation practice, that's repression and it's stressful, and it looks like it works in the same way that a parent that just doesn't let kids, you know, that doesn't let them act out at all, it seems like the house is orderly until the kids grow up to be serial killers or whatever because <laughs> they weren't allowed to be kids. And our mind is our mind, you know, it, it does, anger is anger, it's like it's got all these different tendencies. And it's totally fine. You can check out hating it and trying to dominate the mind and see how that works. It doesn't work very well. But there is a way to create space. And the, the neat thing about that is, even though it can be wild, we're not feeding the wildness. We're not cultivating the wildness. It begins to quiet down. It just doesn't do it all at once. Just because I'm aware, all that negativity, all those habits to be defensive and envious and, you know, they don't just disappear because there's awareness. Initially, awareness feels that, sees that. Oh yeah, it's wild. It hurts. I care about it. I'm not afraid of it, right? But th the neat thing is, is that there's no feeding of those unwholesome tendencies. There's awareness of it. And awareness doesn't feed the negative. You could try that. Like when you're aware of being angry, are you feeding the anger? If you're feeding the anger, then you're identified with the anger, not aware of it. So that's a nice way to get to know awareness. Awareness isn't the mind that's identified with whatever's happening. It's the mind that understands that it's like this, that what's arising is lawful given what's in motion and that it feels like this. And to some degree, there's a fearlessness. It's okay to feel this. It's okay to let this move. And of course, when it, there isn't enough confidence and it doesn't feel safe to let this move, we still don't repress it. What we do is we say, well, what can I be present with? I guess I can't be present with this emotion because I just get identified and I start to act it out. Well, maybe I'll be aware, I'll just feel my hands on my thighs because that's not triggering. So now, even though this sensation of my hands resting on my thighs or hearing the blower, you know, some neutral sound, even though it's not the predominant experience that's in the forefront of my attention, I've trained myself to be able to bring interest to something ordinary like we do with the breath. And so I'll bring my attention to some other aspect that's not triggering, 
and I'll learn to be present with that. You can even open your eyes, like when there's a real storm or emotional storm happening, and you realize, okay, seeing, you know, hearing, seeing. Go to those more neutral experiences and realize, I can be present with this. If you can't even do that, maybe do some walking, because the, the physicality of walking is a grosser, more dominant experience, so you can easier for the awareness to go with that. And then when you then you won't be at least you won't be feeding the drama when it's really seductive. That's why people like when they're really obsessing, people who have a good sense will call a friend. Let's go take a walk. I don't want to sit at home and stew with this. I'm just tying the knot tighter. So whatever we can do to change the channel, and the question to ask is, what can I do and be present doing it? Because I don't want to just use distraction, like watching TV. I mean, sometimes we do that. And it's better still than just spinning with the obsession or the hate or the whatever or the vortex might be. But it's good to cultivate awareness because then we'll trust it so when another storm comes, because that storm's not going to go away, it's going to revisit. But now we have the confidence, well, maybe I can just feel what's moving here. It's intense, it's unpleasant, but I don't think I'm afraid. I think I can really just let it move. Oh yeah, it's intense. It feels like it's, it's going to eat me alive, but will it? <laughs> and, we, and we check it out, and after enough times we realize that really painful experience doesn't eat us alive. It's actually healing when we don't get caught or identified with it. And it's a razor's edge sometimes where we're sort of getting sucked in and we're sort of maintaining some space of wisdom that understands it's like this now. And we really learn a lot on those edges where it's messy, where we are getting somewhat identified in moments, but then wisdom awareness reestablishes itself. Oh yeah, no, no, it's just this. It's just a lot of anger moving right now. You just want to burn it all down feels like this, but it's just this strong emotion moving here in the body and mind. And honey, you know how to be with that. You feel it. And you, you remember it's healing when you're not identified. It doesn't actually damage you even though it's intense. It just feels like it might. Same thing with like strong grief. This is something that a lot of you might know. Because, you know, it's not that uncommon that we experience significant loss, right? And isn't it true in the grieving process, which can last a long time, of course, that there are moments where the grief is moving, it's intense, the sadness, but there are moments when, for whatever reason, there's wisdom, awareness that really trusts the pain of the sadness, of the loss, and it's intense, but it feels intense in a good way, like, something that mo is moving that needs to move. And then it shifts our relation relationship to the grieving going forward. And that may be a way of understanding grieving. It's not like the sadness necessarily goes away forever, but our relationship to the sadness changes. There's just more space, more willingness. We're not letting the sadness define us. It's just part of who we are that wound of losing that person, let's say, we live with it. It becomes who we are, and we don't have to like box it away, hide it away. It's just, and now it's kind of makes life more rich and pointed. It's, it's actually, we like the energy of it, because it's real. And what's also real is the not being afraid of it. And so it's sort of a symbol of living our life not afraid of anything more and more in that direction. So we have to leave it here, it's 8.30. But how about Gwen? I'll un go ahead and unmute yourself, Gwen, and we'll just end with your comment or question. Thank you, and hello everybody. My name is Gwen, and I am originally from the Dayton, Cincinnati area where I did attend uh, and tried to learn to meditate at Gold Gardroma in Dayton, Ohio, that Sangha. 
um, I brought my stimulus checks up here and came to the place I've always wanted to be. Uh, after uh, I was shunned by my hometown and COVID hit coincidentally at the same time two years ago. And what's interesting is that as a severe trauma survivor, um, you know, some people might have perceived me as running away and dissociating and running away from trauma and stuff never seems to work because it always seems to somehow come around if it's not resolved. And what's ended up happening is um, I'm about to turn 35 years sober. And though I've been playing around with insight meditation for a while, I'm, this is my first formal class. And I, I, got, I must be a little bit better at it than I think I am. Because two things are interesting uh, lay happening, and and I want to share them because I think that validates the 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 wholeness and the entirety of, of tonight's uh, meeting. Um, first of all, that is that when I am present for the feelings, the flashbacks, the memories that show up, and just allow myself to be present, it's almost as though the intensity and the distress reduce because there's almost an an equilibrium of energy that ends up sort of spreading and balancing out and it's it there's there's a peace that does come but at the same time what's also interesting is that i am experiencing the first but the first uh, severe and chronic pain of my whole life and being 35 years sober i believe in in energy and, and healing energy. And if I allow, and as I did tonight with all of you, focus on the fact that the crumbled bone at, at the base of my thumb is rubbing against the nerves. And if I just acknowledge that pain and just, you know, just, just give it respect and, and coexist with it rather than running for it, um, it works better than any narcotic ever did. It, 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 so I've had both a physical and a, an emotional, um, literally, uh, you know, reduction in intensity, but a great peace because I'm willing to give these painful experiences. I think the respect that their dominance has had for their dominance that they've had and yet acknowledged it and ultimately been thankful for it. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Gwen. That's a nice way to end our class tonight. Just a little testimonial to the work that we're going to be doing. Well, wishing you a good week of practice, everyone. Remember, you may not like, want to come back next Tuesday, but come back anyway. We're doing this together. And have a good week of practice. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.